Damien, Harold, and I were best friends since we were toddlers. Our moms told us we met in the park one day, and since then, we've been inseparable. We all went to the same schools and tried to make sure that we took the same classes, too. In our second year of high school, we had the craziest adventure of our lives, and it all started in science class. But before I continue, please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. I don't want you to miss out on any more amazing stories. It was a Monday, the first day of school. We walked into the science laboratory after lunch and sat together. I hope Ms. Smith is really teaching our class this year, Damien said. He was so excited. <laughs> yeah, I sure hope so. We haven't had a hot teacher in a while. They're all so plain looking. I need some eye candy. What do you think, Carlos? Harold chuckled while looking at me. I started daydreaming. Miss Smith was absolutely gorgeous, and she was part of the reason I chose science that year. But my happy thoughts didn't last for a very long time. My daydreams were cut short as a serious-looking old man walked through the door. Welcome to science class. I'm your teacher, Mr. Carter. You might have heard about me before. I'm the best teacher here. No one has ever failed my class. I've won so many awards and I've been offered jobs all over the planet. But I've chose to remain at this school to help you kids, he laughed. It was true. He was the most respected teacher at our school, and we should have felt honored to be in his class. But instead, we were just frustrated. Where's Miss Smith? Damien wailed. She's moved to Alaska. She got tired of you teenage boys fantasizing about her. Besides, I'm just as good looking, Mr. Carter smirked. We heard groans all over the classroom. The rest of the day flew by, and after school, we went back to my house to play video games. It was our only way to relax after such a disappointing day. Hey, pipsqueaks, my older brother Jonathan said while interrupting our game and grabbing our bowl of snacks. How was school? He asked. We paused our game and grabbed my bowl of snacks back from him. School was going great until we found out that Mr. Carter is going to be our science teacher for the year, Harold groaned. Have you seen Miss Smith? I dreamt about her all summer long, only to be greeted by that old man and his lame jokes. I will never recover from this. Mr. Carter? Jonathan asked while looking worried. Yeah, you know him? What's the matter? I asked. I don't know, that guy is weird. A few years ago, I was in his class. Everything was fine, really. He's a funny guy. But one day, my friend Yuri started failing assignments. Mr. Carter invited her over to his house for private tutoring. He said he really wanted to make sure that she passed his class and eventually her final exams, so she went, he said. Then he went silent and looked like he was staring into space. And then, I asked, and then, well, Yuri was never the same. After only one night of tutoring, she aced every single exam and assignment after that. But she changed. She used to be a happy, bubbly soul, but when she came back to class, she seemed dull and lifeless. She had this cold, sad stare in her eyes. It was almost like she didn't even remember who I was. Maybe it's because you're such a loser, I laughed. The boys and I disregarded his story and continued our game. The next few weeks at school were quite ordinary. We continued our usual routine of school, home, and video games. Then, one day, Harold got one of his assignments back from Mr. Carter, who looked a bit angry. Harold, you're putting no effort into your work. This is the fourth time I've had to give you an F. I think you owe me some sort of explanation, he said. I guess I don't really understand the science stuff. I don't plan to do any of this after I leave school anyway. I'm going to be an architect. Besides, I only joined this class to stare at Miss Smith, Harold replied. See me after class, Mr. Carter said coldly and then walked away. After class, Damien and I waited outside for Harold. This old bloke said I have to come over to his house for a private tutoring session. He says it'll make me pass and that if I don't come, there'll be serious consequences. But we plan to play games tonight. I'm going to kick your butt in FIFA 21 instead. Forget science, Harold said when he came outside. I think you should just go. It's one night anyway. It'll be fine. We can play FIFA all weekend, I said. We managed to persuade him to go to Mr. Carter's house, completely forgetting the story my brother had told us a few nights before. So he went that night while Damien and I played video games at my house until my mom chased him away and sent me to bed. The next day, we spotted Harold in the hallway before class. Hey man, what's up? How was your tutoring session? Damien asked. Fine, he said and walked away. Fine? I looked at Damien worriedly. Harold never gave one-word answers to anything. In fact, it was hard to get him to shut up. This was not like him at all. We followed him to English class and tried to continue talking to him. Aren't you glad it's Friday? 
We get to relax all weekend, and you don't have to worry about stupid science, I laughed. Science isn't stupid. It's a vital part of our lives. I wish you two would stop being so immature, he replied. We were flabbergasted. Words like immature weren't even part of Harold's vocabulary. In fact, Harold was the definition of immature. Um, who are you and what have you done with our friend? Damien laughed and rolled his eyes. This would have been fine if he had snapped back to normal, but he didn't. For an entire week, all we got out of Harold were one-word responses and cold expressions. We tried to figure it out, but we couldn't. Do you think your brother's story is true? Damien asked while we were relaxing in his living room one evening. I laughed at it, but it seems that the same thing that happened to Jonathan's friend is happening to Harold. He really isn't himself. He's been avoiding us too, I replied. I wonder what happens at that weird tutoring session. Maybe we should investigate, said Damien. We put our heads together and came up with a plan. Damien would fail all of his assignments and quizzes on purpose. Hopefully, Mr. Carter would set up one of his weird tutoring sessions and then we'd know what really happens. But what if the same thing happens to me? How will you know what happened if I don't tell you? Damien asked. We'll set up a recording device and hide it in your clothes. While you're over there, I'll be able to listen to everything that's going on, I replied. We got to work the next week. Damien consistently failed everything while Harold aced every single exam. It took about a month, but Mr. Carter finally asked to speak to Damien after class and set up a tutoring session for that same evening. This is it, I said to Damien as we went to his house that afternoon to prepare. I had already ordered the recording device and hooked it up to my phone and PC. When he was all ready to leave, he said, I don't really know about this. I have a bad feeling and I'm really nervous. Come on, don't be. We've worked very hard to get this far. Well, I mean, you failed everything and that wasn't hard work, but we have to find out what happened to Harold. We're doing this for him. And remember, I can hear everything. It'll be fine, I said. He looked like he felt reassured. Now go quickly and I'll go home to monitor you on my PC, I said. We parted ways and I went home quickly. As soon as I got home, I went up to my room and began listening to Damien and Mr. Carter. I was just on time. I heard Damien knock on the door and I heard Mr. Carter come to open it. I pictured it all in my head as it was happening. Thanks for coming, Damien. Come in. Here, have a seat. I've ordered some pizza so you can have a snack before we start, Mr. Carter said. Uh, thanks. How long is it going to take? Damien asked. Not too long. Don't worry, Mr. Carter replied. I heard two chairs being pulled out, so I assumed that they were now sitting down. It also sounded like Damien was chewing. Mmm, this pizza is good, Damien said. The pig, I thought. Then I didn't hear him for a while. Are you okay? Mr. Carter said. I just feel a bit drowsy, Damien replied. Then I heard a thud. After that, I heard some shuffling. Then I heard loud footsteps and grunting. It sounded like Damien was being carried down some steps. Finally, I heard a door open and what I heard next terrified me. I heard several screams and pleads for help. Let us out. We're hungry. Help us. Don't leave us here. I heard another thud and then there was silence. I didn't know what to do. Maybe I should have called the police right then, but for a few minutes, I was just shocked. I went to the kitchen, then ran back up to my room. I still heard nothing through the recording device. I dialed Damien's number and he picked up right away. Hey, are you okay? I asked. Yeah, I'm fine. Why do you ask? He said. All the noises. Well, you'll tell me all about it tomorrow, I said and hung up, relieved that he was okay. The next day, I woke up to a screeching sound from my computer. Carlos, Carlos, can you hear me? It was Damien. Listen, I'm in a basement in Mr. Carter's house. Harold is here too. Mr. Carter gave me some food that made me really drowsy, but before I knocked out, I saw some weird machines in his house. There were people in them. Well, I don't know if they were real people, they might be clones. I could have sworn I saw one that looked just like me. I'm so afraid. And Harold's gotten so skinny, he only throws some scraps of bread in here once in a while. This is crazy, you have to help us. Unfortunately, I could only listen, but I couldn't reply. I got ready quickly and went to school to see if Damien, well, his clone, was there. I bumped into him almost as soon as I walked in through the gate. Damien, I said. What? It replied with the same cold stare that Harold had a few weeks ago. You need to come with me, quickly. Just be quiet and run, it's an emergency. I said and I grabbed his arm. Surprisingly, it ran with me all the way to my house. I brought it to my room, knocked it on its head and tied it up. Good, now stay there and be quiet, 
I said while taping its mouth shut. Then, I went straight to the police station to report a kidnapping. At first, they laughed at my story, but then I played Damien's recording and they started to take me a bit more seriously. Because it was a school day, Mr. Carter was somewhere in class. We drove over to his house and broke the door open. I stared at all the odd bodies stored in huge glass containers filled with some kind of liquid. For a while, I was frozen. Then I remembered. Harold, Damien, they're in the basement, I shouted. The police found the basement door and broke it open. When we looked inside, we could not believe it. There were at least 20 kids and even some adults in there. Damien and Harold ran out. You did it, Carlos! The policemen had to call for backup and a few of them went to the school to arrest Mr. Carter. Several ambulances arrived to take away everyone. Harold and Damien were taken to the hospital and I suddenly remembered that I had Damien's clone tied up in my room. I informed the policemen who went to get him. Everyone was completely confused, of course. How was a simple science teacher able to create such accurate clones? And if he had such a remarkable discovery, why did he choose to teach at a high school? Apparently, the clone's brains were programmed to be able to ace all his exams. It was almost like they were half human, half robot. But why would someone do all that work just to seem like a good teacher? It was all too weird. This case is still being investigated and it has not been publicized. All of the clones have been captured and sent to a secure research laboratory. Damien, Harold, and I are regarded as heroes in our town now. We decided that we'd start a small business together after we leave high school because we want to be as far away from teachers and professors as possible. We don't trust them anymore. Oh my god, I just got accepted to my dream college, my older brother Jeffrey screamed. My mom, dad, and sister began clapping and cheering. I just stood in shock and sadness. Mom, dad, you both just lost your jobs. How are you guys going to afford that? I said, snapping everyone back to reality. The room instantly went quiet. She's right, son. I don't even know how I'm going to continue paying for Ari to attend that special school, my dad said. But before I go on, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. My little sister, Ariane, had cerebral palsy and she needed extra care and attention. After my parents both lost their jobs, Everything seemed to fall apart. How are we supposed to make ends meet? It's okay, guys. I will just continue working at the diner for now. I'll get to go to college someday, my brother said softly. My heart broke for him because I knew he'd excel at college. He was always at the top of his class, and I knew that he'd probably make enough money to take care of the whole family when he came back from college. I sighed and went to sleep. The next day was Saturday. I'd usually take Ari to the park for some fresh air. I laid a blanket on the grass and took out her favorite snacks and a few little toys. She clapped with excitement. After a while, I noticed Mr. and Mrs. Medlin sitting on the bench a few feet away. They were looking at us intently. Naturally, I was spooked out. The Medlins were the wealthiest people in our very superstitious neighborhood. They lived in the Medlin Manor, which had been passed down to them by their wealthy ancestors. Although they were rich, no one in town would associate with them. There was a rumor that anyone who went near their manor would disappear. Servants who worked there previously also claimed to hear odd noises and to see strange apparitions at different times of the day. Some had been scared away on their first day of work. Everyone believed the house was haunted and that the entire Medlin family had something to do with it. Suddenly, they got off the bench and walked towards me. I was terrified. What did they want with me? Hi, Zaria, said Mrs. Medlin. Hi, how do you know who I am? I said, shaking. It's a very small town, dear, she replied. Do you know our son Elliot? Mr. Manor asked. Um, yes, he goes to my school, I said. I avoided Elliot like everyone else at school did. In fact, he was the least popular kid at school. Everyone stayed away from him since kindergarten because of his family's odd reputation. I sometimes felt sorry for him, but I was also superstitious and it was too risky to talk to him. Well, we know that your family is going through a bit of a hard time right now, and we would like to help. No one wants to be Elliot's friend, and he's a teenager now. I think it's about time he had a female companion, you know, like a girlfriend. But girls run away from him because of those silly rumors that started years ago. None of them are true, by the way. Anyway, 
What we came here to ask you is if you'd consider dating our son, Mr. Medlin said. What? I replied, dumbfounded. This was indeed the weirdest thing anyone had asked from me, ever. We will pay you, he continued, once per week. Come on, please, he really needs a friend. I was angry and began screaming at him. If you think you can just pay me to... But before I could finish, he said, $100,000 a week, and winked at me. My jaw dropped. With that kind of money, I could turn my family's life around. I took about a minute to think about it, but I finally agreed. They told me that they'd deposit the money into my bank account once per week, and that they'd continue doing it for as long as I date their son. I took my little sister home while smiling all the way. You're going to be able to go to an even better school, I said to her while she giggled. The next week, I began pursuing Elliot. I decided that I'd accidentally bump into him near his locker. Ow. I swallowed my fear and did just that. Hey, Elliot, I'm sorry for bumping into you. I feel a bit dizzy today. Anyway, my name's Zaria, I said. Um, hi. Do you need help with anything? He replied. No, I'll be okay, but I was uh, wondering, would you maybe you like to hang out after school? I said. Okay, sure. I'll meet you outside of the science lab when the bell rings, he replied. Wow, this was all too easy, I thought while thinking of that money. After school, we walked around for a while just talking about whatever random topics came to our heads. I discovered that we had a lot in common. We liked the same music, books, and TV shows. He was actually quite funny and handsome. We continued to hang out every day after school. One afternoon, while we were sitting at the fast food place drinking soda, he suddenly asked, Why did you decide to talk to me? No one talks to me. It's like they're avoiding a plague or something, and I'm that plague. Well, I believe that everyone deserves a chance, and I think it's unfair how everyone has been treating you. I lied. He smiled and I felt awful for being so dishonest. That weekend, I went online to check my bank account balance. And sure enough, my first 100000 had been deposited. I nearly screamed with joy. Then I wondered how I'd give this to my parents. I needed a cover-up story. Hmm, what could I do? I don't want them to think I'm a criminal or anything. Hmm... Oh, that's it. I'll get a part-time job, I thought. I searched online for part-time vacancies in my area, and I sent a few letters to several companies. After a few days, I got a response from a clothing store. I went for an interview and got the job. When I gave this news to my parents, they were happy that I could help out and felt proud that I was taking responsibility and becoming more mature. Elliot would come to hang out with me every day at the store, and after work, he'd walk me home. After a while, we developed a stronger connection, and I asked him to be my boyfriend. He agreed. By that time, I had over $500,000. I hadn't given it all to my parents. I gave them money little by little, and when they asked why I had so much, I just told them that my boss was extremely generous. My sister was able to go to a better school with specialists who were more qualified to take care of her. After two months, my brother had enrolled in his dream college successfully and was completely enjoying his life. I felt so proud, happy, and relieved that I was able to do this for my family. One evening, Elliot invited me over to his house to watch a movie and eat snacks. At first, I freaked out a little bit because I still believed that his house was haunted. But I realized that if I didn't allow our relationship to grow, his parents might stop giving me money. I had grown to enjoy my new riches, so I decided to conquer my fear again. He met me at my house and we walked to his. The Medlin Manor looked much darker and scarier up close. I thought it looked like an old castle. I imagined that there were probably many hidden rooms and pathways inside. He opened the door and we went inside. The interior of the house was just as spooky. Although everything in there looked very elegant and expensive, it was still dark, and I had a bad feeling that I just couldn't shake off. Hey, Zaria, are you okay? You look worried. We don't really have ghosts here, you know, he laughed. <laughs> I, um, I'm okay, I said. She's a really pretty one, his dad winked, and they left the room. I continued to hang out at Elliot's house after work most days. I told my parents I had to work late, and my friends believed that I was home studying. 
despite the rumors, apart from the fact that the Medlin Manor was old and a bit ugly, I heard no strange noises and saw no ghosts. I continued to give my parents money every week. I believe they knew it wasn't all from a generous boss, but we were all so desperate that they took it anyway. Our life improved, but as time went by, I felt more and more guilty about accepting money to date Elliot. I had really started to fall in love. One morning I woke up, and I could not imagine my life without him. That was how close we had become. I felt this heaviness in my heart, which I couldn't ignore anymore. I didn't want to lie to him. At his house that afternoon, I decided to tell him the truth. You have been a great boyfriend to me, and I want you to know that I really appreciate you, I said. And you're the most amazing girlfriend in the universe. I'm so glad you bumped into me near my locker, he smiled. Well, I haven't been completely honest with you about something, and I feel that I need to tell you the truth. I really like you, and I don't want to lose you, but I also don't want to lie to you. Your parents have been paying me to date you, I said. He said nothing and stared blankly. I will stop taking their money. At first I accepted because my family was in a really bad place financially, but now it feels wrong. I don't want you to feel like I'm dating you for money. It's because I really love you, I said while wiping a tear. It's fine, Zaria. I knew everything all along. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. At that point, his parents walked into the room. Apparently they had been listening to everything. That's correct, dear. He always knew. We don't keep secrets from our son. Anyway, we have another request, said Mrs. Medland. This sudden change of events was too much for me. Our family has a tradition of choosing our children's spouses. We would like you to be Elliot's wife someday, but not here. We would like you to leave the state with him and live together until you are legally allowed to get married. After you are husband and wife, we will hand over half of our fortune to you. We trust you, and we'd like you to become a member of our family. She continued while smiling. We don't want you to say anything to your family. It has to seem like you've disappeared. Most people know that you've been dating Elliot, and another Medlin Manor disappearance will be good for the image we're trying to maintain. Mr. Medlin smirked. This was the strangest conversation of my life, but in the end I agreed to do what they asked me because they promised to ensure that my family would always have money. I wanted the best for them, and I also loved Elliot, so I figured it was a win-win situation. I believed that I'd see them again someday, so I tried to remain optimistic. Now everyone in town believes that I've disappeared, or worse, that I've been murdered by the Medlins. Everyone continues to fear them, and no one will go near their house. Meanwhile, I'm very happy with the love of my life, but I really miss my family sometimes. My name is Gaia. I'm 16 years old, and I'm probably the most beautiful girl you will ever meet in your life. For this reason, I'm extremely popular at school. Everyone has heard of me, and everyone wants to be my friend. My teachers literally worship the ground I walk on, and the principal lets me get away with practically anything. But school is just a small part of my life, considering that I'm already one of the most popular models in my state. I have over 200,000 followers on Instagram, a huge fan base if you ask me. I work part-time for a modeling company that sends me to different countries to model. I've flown first class more times than an ordinary person can hope to fly economy. The best part about this job is the free stuff. I get designer clothes, shoes, bags, perfumes, accessories, you name it. All I have to do is walk around with my awesome stuff and continue being breathtakingly beautiful. It probably seems like I have the perfect life, right? Wrong. There is something about me that I rarely discuss with anyone because it makes me feel bad about myself. I have never gone on a date. In fact, I've never even had a boyfriend. Guys pretend that they like me, they talk to me, and then they suddenly disappear, leaving me confused and heartbroken. Even the nerdiest girl at school has a boyfriend, and well, I'm just here. It doesn't make any sense at all. I should have guys fighting to decide who will get to take me out. But instead, I spend my weekends and evenings alone in my room, avoiding my mom and ugly older sister. When I'm not traveling, that is. Last year, I almost went out with a guy called Drake. He's a senior at my school, and he's like the male equivalent of me. Totally gorgeous. I'd get butterflies if I thought he was in the room next door. One day, he just walked up to me while I was studying in the library. You're too beautiful, you know. Are you sure you're from this planet? He said. 
<laughs> I giggled like a total idiot. Well, I could say the same about you, I replied. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while, but I was sort of afraid. Do you have a boyfriend? He asked. No, I replied. Oh, great. Um, I, I mean, okay. You seem like the kind of girl who has many guys to choose from, so I didn't think I stood a chance. Could I have your number? I thought this was finally my chance. I gave him my number without thinking twice. That night and for many nights after, we stayed up until two in the morning talking to each other. We got to know each other really well. He was so funny and charming, but I was sad that I only got to see him at school. I wanted to experience my first date and even more, my first kiss. But that was not about to happen. One day, Drake just stopped replying to my messages. When I saw him at school, he would pretend he didn't see me and walk the other way. I tried to ask him what was wrong, but he refused to talk to me. This was my first real heartbreak. Imagine having your first heartbreak before your first date. Pathetic, right? Anyway, I felt much better when I met Brad at one of my modeling shoots. He went to a school nearby, and he was an intern at the same photography company that was taking my pictures that day. After nearly throwing his camera on the floor several times because he was so nervous, he finally got the courage to talk to me. I follow you on Instagram, and I think you have some wonderful pictures on there. Here's another one you can add, he said while showing me a picture he took with his camera. Hi, thanks. I blushed shyly. It really was a good picture. We spoke briefly that afternoon, but later he sent me a message on Instagram. Hey, gorgeous model, what's your favorite food? He typed, pizza, I replied. Well, I know this really good place downtown. Would you like to go out to get some next Saturday? He said, sure. What time? I wrote. We decided to meet at seven in the evening. Although it was a whole week away, I was so nervous. We spoke a lot and as time went by, I felt more comfortable with him. When the day finally arrived, I spent the whole morning planning my outfit. By the afternoon, I had changed my mind about what I wanted to wear and had spent hours trying to figure out something different. Then I had to do my makeup. At 6.30, I made my way downtown to the restaurant. I walked in and looked around. He wasn't there, so I sat down and ordered a Coke. Almost one hour later, he still wasn't there. I was angry. He stood me up. How could he do this to me with no explanation at all? What the hell? Where are you? I texted him. There was no answer. I went home and cried. At 10, he still hadn't replied. The next day, I was hoping he would have sent a long apology and explained what happened. Maybe he'd gotten into an accident or something like that. It had to be something serious if he was completely ignoring me. He never answered. Was I ghosted again? At this point, I felt there was no hope for my dating life. Was something wrong with me? I'm beautiful, so I knew it wasn't that, but did I smell bad? What was it? Why would no guy take me seriously? And why would no guy take me out on a real date? It was Sunday, and I decided that I needed to do something to cheer myself up. I put on my gym outfit and went running near the park. Experiencing a runner's high was just what I needed. I wanted to feel the wind on my face and to worry about nothing at all. After running for about half an hour, I began to think about Brad again. While I was distracted with my sad thoughts, I tripped over my shoelaces and fell down. I hadn't even realized they were untied. I hit my head really badly and it felt like it was bleeding. I could taste the concrete. Hey, are you okay? A male voice said. Obviously not, I replied without looking up. He reached for my arm and tried to lift me off the ground. I turned my head and in an instant, everything was perfect in the world. Staring me in the face, was the most handsome guy I had ever seen in my life. He had brown hair, brown eyes, very fine features, and an amazing body. Here, let me get that for you, he said while reaching into his backpack. He pulled out a cloth and began to wipe my face. Don't worry, it's clean, he said. When he was done, he helped me get to a nearby bench and sat next to me. So what are you doing here running all by yourself and falling into the arms of strangers, he said. Well, I was really sad about my date not showing up last night. I really liked him, and he's totally ignoring me right now, I replied. I don't know why I was telling him all of this, but it just felt like I could trust him. What a stupid guy. Well, he doesn't deserve you if he treated you like that. If he was serious, he'd make sure you knew that you were very special to him. Anyway, I'm Samuel. It's lovely to meet you. What is your name? He said. I thought for a while and realized that what he was saying was true. Besides, I wasn't thinking about Brad anymore with this fine specimen by my side. My name's Gaia. It's nice to meet you too. Enough about my problems. 
What are you doing here? I asked. Well, same as you, I guess. I used to go to the gym, but I changed my routine a bit. Now I go jogging every morning, he replied. We sat there and talked for what seemed like hours. When we realized it was getting too late, we exchanged contact information so we could stay in touch. We spoke constantly each day. He became more than just some guy I'd talk to. He was a dear friend. I told him almost everything. My thoughts, my dreams, what worried me, and what made me happy. He spoke to me about everything, too. We never got to see each other, and I was hoping that he'd finally ask me out. There was no better person I could imagine myself sharing a first date with. I began to imagine all the possible scenarios. Should we go to an amusement park? It'd be fun, but we'd hardly get to talk. Should we go to the movies? We could get cozy in there, and maybe it would set the mood for my first kiss later. Or how about a simple stroll by the sea? He'd hold my hands, tell me he loved me, and oh, it was just too much to imagine. The day finally came. I had just gotten off my bed one morning and I was brushing my teeth when I heard a notification on my phone. I picked it up and it was a text message from Samuel. Hey, sweetie, would you like to go to watch a movie with me tomorrow night? It said, yes. I replied with way too many exclamation marks at the end. Oh my gosh. I thought he's going to think I'm desperate. I was so excited. I started thinking about what I'd wear and what we would do after the movies. Suddenly, these happy thoughts were quickly destroyed by doubts. What if he ghosted me just like the other two guys? What would I do then? I needed a plan. I decided that instead of allowing him to ghost me like the others had done, I would show up at his house three hours before the movie. That way, he would have to go out with me even if he changed his mind. There was one problem, though. I didn't know where he lived. There's not a problem that technology can't fix. I thought as I grabbed my phone and scrolled through his Instagram pictures. Jackpot! I shouted. There was a picture of his two dogs in front of their house. The location was visible, and although I couldn't see the exact address, I had a pretty good idea of where the house was and what it looked like. The next day, I was determined to have a perfect day. I called Samuel to make sure we were still on for later. He said yes, and the first few hours of the day flew by. When it was time, I left home and went to search for Samuel's house. It took a good half hour, but I finally found a house which matched the picture. I walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell. A little girl opened the door and stared at me with eyes wide open. Whoa, you're so pretty. Will you be my friend? She said as Samuel approached. Gaia, what are you doing here? How did you even find my house? Uh, You know what? Never mind. Come in, he said. He looked so happy to see me. When I was inside, he introduced me to his parents and went to get ready. Well, since you're here early, I guess we can do something before the movie, he said. About 15 minutes later, we heard the doorbell ring. I'll get it, shouted Samuel. He was already ready. I followed him to the door, and as he opened it, I had the fright of my life. Standing in front of us was the most massive man I had ever seen. He was dressed in black and carrying a huge gun. I came to deliver a message to Samuel. Listen very clearly. If you continue to see Gaia, I will have to hurt you. Stop talking to her now and you will be safe. If you do not listen to my warning, you will have a serious price to pay. He growled. He then slammed the door and walked away. I was so confused. Who was he? I had never seen him before in my life. I decided to run after him to get some answers. When I finally caught up to him, I grabbed his arm. Who are you? Why did you threaten the only guy I really liked? I cried. You aren't supposed to know this, but you have some very dangerous people in your family you've never met. They are the ones who have been paying me to do this. I will continue until you are 18. It's only then that the complete truth will be revealed to you, he said and calmly walked away. Now it all made sense. This monster had been chasing away all my potential boyfriends. I ran back to Samuel's house to tell him what I found out, but the door was locked and they wouldn't open it. I had no choice but to go home all alone. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed my story, leave a like, subscribe to this channel, and check out our other videos. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. Hi, my name is Dylan, and I actually graduated when I was only 12 years old. It sounds crazy, right? You must think I'm some kind of genius or something. Well, that's not totally untrue, since I did get a super high score in my IQ test, but that's not totally it. The thing is, My parents made going to school a real hell, so I just wanted out of there as soon as possible.
Let me tell you a bit about my childhood and my folks so you can understand what drove me to this. I was my mom and dad's only child, and they meant it that way. They didn't want to waste their time raising more than a single kid. That was because they wanted to dedicate all their attention to only one son or daughter. That way, they'd get me to reach my full potential. They both were teachers and had met when they first began working at the same school. They had reputations for being super strict with students. Mom loved the way my dad scolded the children, and dad fancied the way she would make an entire classroom go quiet with a single glare. So, as you can imagine, they weren't exactly gentle and forgiving when it came to children at all. They believed that discipline was the only way to raise a good kid. When I was born, they didn't change their minds. Perhaps they even became more convinced of this fact. They wanted me to be the very best at anything I put my mind to, and that meant starting raising me to excel from a very young age. And by young, I mean when I was one month old. I know you must imagine a little newborn baby being placed in front of books. That's an amusing idea, but it's not what my parents did. Instead, they began with a strict program of early stimulation. I had a time schedule for everything, even when I was just a little baby. So at first, it was all games, but really structured ones. First music, then lights, then motion, then speech training, and so on. It was fun, I guess but I never had any time to just play randomly or act silly. My parents didn't accept me being silly, no matter how young I was. They always expected me to behave like a small adult. So that meant no running around, no screaming, no throwing tantrums, or anything of the sort. Mom and Dad were super strict. Breaking any rule meant being punished, and they were really creative when it came to that. They knew just how to make me feel awful about misbehaving while never raising their voice at me. They never ever hit me, but they were so strict that it still felt awful. They weren't the hugging type. I think I remember at most two or three times my mom hugged me, and absolutely none when it comes to my father. I don't think he ever told me he was proud of me either. Being praised by my father was simply not being criticized. If he had nothing bad to say, that meant I had done a good job. But being recognized is also important. My dad didn't see it that way. He thought that it would make me weak and lead me to slacking off. So yeah, that was my childhood. No hugs, constant punishments, and so much pressure to be the best. Ah, yes, I almost forgot to tell you one other detail. It wasn't enough to get great grades. Oh no, if I got an A, but someone else got an A+, I had failed. I had to be the best student in every single class. And don't even get me started with the pressure they put on me to always be the top of my class. One year, I ended up second. I was grounded all summer long. They didn't even let me go to the park or the cinema once. I had gotten straight A's, but my teacher decided a fellow student had been a bit better than me, and that made my parents furious. They blamed me for it, of course, and I had to spend my entire summer studying. I love reading and studying, actually, but that was complete hell. They were constantly checking in on me to make sure I wasn't slacking off even for a minute. My parents didn't just let my teachers handle my education. They added on to it when I was at home. I learned my multiplication tables before I was even in first grade. They tested me constantly, and soon I realized I was an extremely fast learner. They encouraged me to research advanced subjects in my free time. At first, it was fun, but then it became something that was expected of me instead of a hobby. That made even my free time a sort of chore. They also kept going to my principal's office to pressure him into allowing me to skip grades. Sometimes he refused, saying that it was not good for my emotional development, but they said that was a lie. I was mature and could handle the pressure. I think that, in a way, I was an experiment of sorts to my parents. See how their strict way of educating a child worked. I wish that they would have been more concerned with showing me they loved me than how good I was at math or science or literature. Anyways, by the time I was 10, I had already graduated from middle school. I could do advanced math in my head and read complex literature. I honestly loved reading about just about any subject I could. Math, physics, history, and even chemistry were right up my alley. I seemed to be able to just soak up all the information I researched. 
My mom and dad ruined the fun in that as well. You know how? After I was done reading any book, they quizzed me on it to check how much I remembered. If I ever didn't ace their little quizzes, they made me read it again. You can imagine how that got really old really fast. Honestly, going to school was the easiest part of my day. None of my teachers could ever be as bad as my parents were. It was sort of my place to relax, in an odd way, but I still hated it so much. Because each time I arrived home, my parents were there to hound me with all kinds of questions and demands. Had I been the best in my class that day? Answered all the questions? Did I have any tests? What about my homework? Had my teachers praised me? They always wanted me to take apples to my teachers, and that humiliated me so much. What's funny is that, though I was the youngest guy in every single grade, I never got bullied. Not even when I arrived at school with a gift my parents forced me to give to my teachers. I don't know if it was because my classmates really liked me or if they wanted me to help them with their homework. One way or another, I liked having friends. Talking with them was the only time during my busy day when I could just relax and sort of be a kid. I loved having lunch with them and talking about something other than my grades and how I was never good enough. Sure, I let them copy my homework and even help them study. I really didn't mind at all, and it gave me the chance to stay away from home a bit longer. I actually began tutoring some older kids at one point. My parents didn't want me to do it at first. They claimed it would distract me from my own studies. That was until I reminded them I could add that to my curriculum for my college application. Then they were all for it. If something didn't help me become the best, they simply thought it was a complete waste of time. That was why I only met with my friends when I was at school. I wasn't allowed to visit my classmates' houses except if I was there to tutor them, and they certainly couldn't come to my place. Birthdays, slumber parties, gatherings, all those things were forbidden. My parents claimed it was to keep me away from silly distractions. What they didn't seem to understand was that I really needed to have friends. It was exhausting having to be nothing but the best all the time without any breaks for socialization. And the few times that they did allow me to hang out with other people, it wasn't the sort of party that was interesting at all. They'd invite geniuses to dinner parties and have them speak to me during supper. I was supposed to ask questions and learn from them. They also wanted me to impress all those people and make them look like the best parents in the world. I was so eager to keep skipping grades, but not for the same reason my parents had. I didn't want to be the best. I just wanted to get it all over with. I wanted high school to end and so my parents would finally let me be. Now, something else kind of strange happened. Girls seemed to really like me. I don't know if it was because they found me cute or fancied my intelligence or what it was. The thing is, girls talked to me all the time. At first, I was way too shy to speak back and I would simply mumble an excuse before leaving. Then I began to awkwardly talk back to them, which was so sad as well. A few years later, I was finally able to get used to dealing with girls without blushing and stuttering like a silly kid. That was when I met Piper, and I liked her so much. She was smart and beautiful and had such a nice smile. I knew that being in a relationship would be really hard because it would demand so much of my time and my parents had every single day planned way ahead of time. I wasn't sure what to do at first, but eventually, the pressure mom and dad had put me through since I was a baby was simply too much to accept. I talked to them and asked what they thought about me dating a girl. They completely freaked out. They told me having a girlfriend was a lot of work. My mom said it was a ridiculous idea even, so I agreed with them, but only outwardly. I decided to sneak behind their backs and date Piper without telling them about it. This went on for a few months. Mom and Dad didn't suspect much, but the one or two times they saw me with her, they scolded me harshly. They reminded me that a girl would only distract me from achieving my true potential. My parents seemed kind of proud. After all, I was graduating at age 12, but they still began speaking about my future that very day. I couldn't believe it. This would never end until I moved far away from them. In the end, I decided to break up with Piper. She was lovely, but we were going in two very different ways. I managed to get into college, and that meant moving away from my parents. To allow me to do this, they decided to emancipate me when I was only 13. I couldn't believe I was finally free from them. 
Of course, they believe they'd still continue dictating my life, but I showed them otherwise. Now, I didn't depend on them any longer and had a full ride to college. I have completely cut them off. I haven't spoken to either of them in months and have never been happier. Thank you for watching. What's the worst thing your parents did to you supposedly for your own good? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and check other videos in the channel.